Well, personally, I try to run a lean business, but most importantly, and this may be counterintuitive, I take profits first. And then sort of what's left is what I can afford in expenses. Hey there, high performers. This is Dr. Josh Funk. In this podcast, I will be interviewing people from the sports and business world who have experienced hardship and come out on top. Through their challenges, strategies, and mindset, I hope that it will give you the tools you need to perform for life. Hey, high performers. This is Dr. Funk here, and I am very excited to bring to you Jandy Turner. I had the fortune of meeting her a couple years ago through a program called the Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Program. Uh, it was something that was very pivotal for me and overall I've just really enjoyed having a relationship with her, uh, being able to have a company that also can support her sons on their particular dreams when it comes to football and academics. But uh, nonetheless, welcome, Jandy. Thank you. Glad to be here. So we're actually able to talk to each other on the day where Maryland goes live with golf. You are deeply immersed in the world of golf, being that that is your business, but golf was not necessarily something that you did all the time growing up. You actually had a passion for basketball. You wanted to potentially play pro basketball at one point, and then eventually you got to UVA and you decided on engineering. But at what point did basketball transition into golf, and what, would the, what was that process like? Sure. Um, when I decided not to p play basketball at UVA, I kind of wallowed around in different things like racquetball, <laughs> like who plays racquetball <laughs> <laughs> and other things like that available at UVA. But it wasn't until after uh, college where, and in fact, I was married where I was, um, it, two things happened. Once in business school, the guys in my class, instead of going to the library to pre prepare for their cases, they would go to the golf course in the afternoon, discuss their cases on the golf course and come back and meet for study group. That was one. So one day I challenged them, why, why don't you guys take me? So they took me to the golf course and it was, you can imagine. So anyway, I never went back. Not as good as my golf game. Gotcha. <laughs> but that being said, once I got married, my husband was an avid golfer and he played a bit. And we were watching the women, the LPGA, play on one Saturday afternoon, they were playing what they call a skins match, where if you win one hole, um, if, if you win that hole, you move on to another hole and, and you win money and so forth and so on. And, so, and it was for a charity event. So I was looking at the ladies and I said, hmm, I'm athletic, they're athletic. I think I can play this game. So I asked my husband if he would teach me how to play the game. And, you know, I insinuated, it was like, oh, yeah, I can learn this. This is easy. He said, I can teach you, but it's not that easy. Never to, nevertheless, he taught me with great patience how to play this game. So I uh, never had lessons at the time. He patiently taught me how to play. And then we would go out on a Saturday morning and play at the local course. And I never wanted to be paired up with anybody. I would say, oh, can you let them go? And that's not how golf works. But nonetheless, that's how I got into learning to play. And once I started to play, I just fell in love with the sport. And it seemed like a very natural fit for you at the time. I mean, you graduated from UVA. You went through the MBA program there. Then you went into more of the consulting world, right? Where I imagine a lot of the people that you were interacting with on a professional level we're also uh, engaging in, in, in golf and, and golf for business. I'm going to plug your book here real quick, right? Golf, the sport of business. Um, at, at, at what point did you recognize that golf was going to be something that eventually turned into a business for you? Sure. And, you know, you referenced my days in management and consulting, and you know how every so often you do an all-hands meeting at some fancy resort or what have you. And time after time, we would do it, and the guys would run off to play golf, and the women would go to the spa. And there was never really any cross, you know, opportunities to build relationships. So I just observed that. But once um, I continued to play golf with my husband, um, I got together a group of women on one Memorial Day. 
and we said, hey, we don't have to go to work on Monday. Let's, you know, 10 of us get together and go play golf. And as it would happen, um, there were actually 16 of us. We played golf. We had a friend that worked for Marriott. And we told her we were doing this mini tournament. She donated some prizes and we got some other prizes. A friend of mine worked for Bank of America at the time. And she cleaned out the closet and gave us golf balls and tees and and that sort of thing. So we did a uh, mini golf tournament on Memorial Day. About 16 people came out. They loved it. They had a great time. As they were leaving, they said, when is your next event? Next event? I don't have a next event. I did it again on Memorial Day. This time men came, women came, everybody came, more people came, had a fantastic tournament. People said, when is your next event? Again, I didn't have a next event. Long story short, I did it again on uh, Labor Day better turnout, so forth and so on. So it, and I was done, I was in consulting, so I didn't, you know, think anything of it. But that winter, every time I ran into somebody, spoke with someone, they said, hey, let me know what your golf schedule is next year. What do you have lined up, so forth and so on. It was at that point that I started to research the golf industry. And I understood that at that time, it was a $70 billion industry. Um, I started to understand that tournaments are big business, that tournaments, when the professional golf tournaments, when they go into a city, they have a huge charitable component where they donate X amount of dollars to the children's hospital or some cause. I also understand that business in golf um, were, were tied together, that many businesses sponsor golf tournaments for a potential ROI in addition to benevolence. So I was just really intrigued by the golf industry. I did a full business school industry analysis on it and figured out that there were opportunities there. Most importantly, I figured out that the growth trajectory for golf, while it was flat, there were segments that were growing. And those segments were women, minorities, and juniors. And I felt like I could play in those segments, despite the fact that golf was sort of, um, you know, leveling off in terms uh, of growth. So I set out to figure out how can I make golf my job? And here here we are. And and here you are with a picture of Dubai in the background, in which you actually have an event in Dubai, right? Yes. At, At what point... Did you recognize that what you were doing really had no limits with regards to golf? I mean, taking an event overseas is a huge undertaking, as I can imagine, but especially going to a place like Dubai. Right, absolutely. Early on, I think I just got a following of people who were thirsty for golf. This is pre-social media and followers as we know them today. But I had a following of people who wanted to know what I was doing in golf and anything I sort of put out there, they decided they wanted to be a part of. So I started off early on doing golf cruises where you would take a nominal Caribbean golf cruise and in every port you would play golf. And I built tournaments around those golf tournaments and people enjoyed those. And then um, I did a survey and asked people, you know, where would you like to go next? What destinations? And time and time again, Dubai kept coming up. So I think it was back in 2014 was the first trip to Dubai and put together a group and a small tournament. And we went to Dubai and I fell in love with it and the people fell in love with it. And since then, I've made it a recurring event every year up until this year, 2020, when uh, COVID canceled our trip about uh, about a week before we were supposed to leave. And you mentioned COVID canceling things. I mean, for you, being in a situation where not only you're in the golf world, but you're in event management, what are some things that you've had to adapt and adjust to as a result of the landscape uh, of our current public health situation? Right. I had a, a what I would call a pretty healthy schedule of events from March through June. And for each and every one of those events, I had to help my clients make decisions 
around do we cancel the event, just flat out cancel it? Do we postpone it? If we postpone it, when? Is that in the fall? Is that 2021? And um, against that backdrop, we had to negotiate contracts and either try and get out of contracts or re redefine contracts and so forth. So I really spent a good portion of March and into April working with my clients to come up with uh, strategies and decisions around what to do with their events. And then once we came up with that, going to venues and working with hotel partners or resort partners to, to manage, those, uh, manage the situation and really figure out what's best for everyone. And I can imagine, I mean, that's not a very easy thing to do. You have a lot of different businesses that their normal operations have been disrupted. So everybody's almost functioning from a probably a, a different baseline. One of the things that you talk about a lot is process. You talk about being very, very good at seeing process and how it can benefit uh, other people, potentially even yourself. Uh, you mentioned a lot of your early career being related to helping sick companies, largely with what I think could be attributed to looking at the process in which they do things. What are some things that you think in your process over the years that have allowed you to put yourself in a situation where you've experienced the success that you've, you've had to date? Right. Um, particularly, um, in the event management business. Once I've done an, uh, an event, sort of going into it, I have a cookbook if it's the first time I've done it, but definitely coming out of it. I have a step-by-step -step process that lays out an event from, let's say we start planning it nine months, a uh, nine month event, step-by-step -step, I lay out what happens, who's responsible for it, who's accountable for it, who needs to be consulted, who needs to be informed of any process, any task that is related to that. So when I walk on site to an event, about 90% of the work obviously is done and it's done through a process. I am also able to hand my own staff uh, and pull a sta on staff, my on site staff members, a uh, what I call an event guide that they could pick up and run the event if I didn't even show up. Now I obviously show up the majority of the time, but I think the process has enabled me one to plan an event, two to execute it, and three to execute it with efficiency. Now I'm always tweaking it. Every event I learn something new and improve it and add back to the, the, the cookbook, if you will. But it just allows for such efficiency. And the first time I do an event, it may take you know nine months to plan it out. The next time, if I wanted to, I could condense it into six months. And then finally, year three, we're really cooking and it is so much more efficient. Yeah, and I think, I mean, I can almost draw a parallel to that. I mean, we've had the ability to open up, you know, our second, third, and fourth location, and that almost being an event in itself, trying to shrink timelines in terms of some of the things that you're doing, trying to skip steps or put yourself in a situation where maybe things are very, very challenging to do wrong, right? How can I make this so easy? It's hard to do wrong. And seeing the, the evolution between location one you're figuring it out over a long period of time. It wasn't necessarily all natural. Location two actually probably was the most challenging thing because it was the reminder that you don't have it all figured out. <laughs> and then three and four, finally getting to a point where you could function a little bit. The Checklist Manifesto is just a, a really, really good book that I've continually referenced back to, but it just gets you into almost automation, right? You don't want to necessarily automate everything, but there should be some things, especially the things that people aren't necessarily feeling or, or, or interacting with, right, that, that are just automatic, they're there, and it, it's almost the minimum standard in which things should be um, uh, completed at. But it's, it's just interesting. I mean, for you, I mean, you've, you've done so many events, it's almost like you've opened up hundreds of, of locations by the, by the amount of events that you've done. But I can imagine you can also appreciate lack of process, uh, maybe not appreciate it, but look at things and kind of go, 
Well, there's a reason why that's not working, especially in a situation where you've dealt with sick companies or companies that are not doing well. Uh, unfortunately, in today's landscape, there's a lot of companies that are struggling or were not primed to succeed with a, with a type of uh, event that goes on like a coronavirus. Are there any things that you remember seeing time and time again that you think didn't put businesses in a position to handle adversity? I think finances are a big thing in being diligent. I mean, obviously, none of us can go on forever, you know, in this situation and still be okay. But I think being thoughtful and intentional and planning for the unknown um, has helped some companies or will help some companies weather this storm. I am big on planning, but I also think you really need to plan for the unknown in so many facets. And I think companies who didn't have more than next week's, you know, cash flow are really struggling right now. And how it's unfortunate, but it's for some of them, it will put them out of business. And that's very unfortunate. I think a big thing that at least has come up in conversations with people that I know, I don't know if it's come up in in your circle at all, but um, situations where, you know, I've almost heard this people over profits mantra where people have a little bit of a social responsibility slant, which obviously I can appreciate during what's going on right now, but not also appreciating the fact that there are some things that ideally are, are, are there from a business standpoint to protect people and ideally to provide a a way of life for them. But recognizing that profits in a business are no different than somebody having extra money during a given month to create a rainy day fund. A business needs profits to have a rainy day fund. There's a word called right at the end of the year, it's retaining or retention, right? We want to distribute to our key personnel, we want to have money for taxes, and then we want to retain. But without profits and money left in that situation, profits not necessarily being distributed to the higher ups, um, we don't have this rainy day fund for business. Is there anything from a, a, a strategy standpoint or even a process standpoint that you found successful uh, or you found to be successful or the people that you've worked with, um, it's allowed them to be successful? Well, personally, I try to run a lean business, but most importantly, and this may be counterintuitive, I take profits first. And then sort of what's left is what I can afford in expenses. And I think, you know, in the past and the way accounting is set up and the way we learn accounting, it's sort of revenue minus your expenses and then that's your profit or what have you. But that doesn't tell you if you're running your business efficiently, especially if you don't have have profit left. So I've sort of flipped the equation and looked at it revenue. Let's take out profit. And what's left is expenses. And that's what I can afford on my, you know, in terms of of my business. So I I don't know. I may be a little bit different in, in thinking about it that way. But if you don't do it that way, I feel like you run the risk of not being able to sustain yourself and particularly in situations like we're in today. So Jane, have you read Profits First before? Actually, I have. Yeah. I mean, that that was a book that I got exposed to at the beginning of last year. Um, It was something that just got me thinking differently. I had always heard the, you know, the concept of paying yourself first, but that dealing with more personal finances. And I think what we started to do differently was ideally just paying the business first, focusing on things like end of the year or even mid-year finances, knowing that taxes had to be accounted for, knowing that there were certain distributions that were going to some of our key personnel, and knowing that we also had certain goals when it came to retention. We need to make sure that we were allocating this money. Otherwise, we're running a business that doesn't have rainy day funds, isn't taking care of its key personnel, and might run into situations where taxes um, were going to be challenging for us to pay. So that book overall, I'd highly, highly recommend it to anybody out there and making sure you know that you're doing things to create an opportunity where you have less financial stress, which is really just taking care of 
paying your business first, much like you would want to pay yourself first. Jandy, going back to something um, that you t alluded to earlier, golf not necessarily being something that you will see a lot of females engaging in, and also not something that you see a lot of minorities engaging in. You're a, an African-American female who is deeply immersed in the sport of golf. What challenges um, and potentially even uh, adversity have you experienced as a result of fitting a demographic that maybe is not normally thought of when people think of golf? Sure. I know that early on when I um, decided that I was going to play in this golf industry, I had a mentor who was um, a wife of a former PGA player. And she recommended that if you're going to be in golf, you need to go to the PGA show, which is the annual industry show for the professional golf industry and or for the golf industry in general. So I went to that show at that time, there were probably about 60,000 people there. And this was back in around two, two, 2002, somewhere around there. There were about 60,000 people there. And I kid you not, I saw about, 15 people of color and maybe five women. As I went to from vendor or exhibitor to exhibitor to exhibitor to learn about their offerings, it was just clear to me whether said or unsaid that people weren't used to seeing me or people who look like me, which, okay, that's fine. But I felt like the golf industry was 30 years behind where we were in America. So, you know, the, the line of thought, the thinking and so forth. So I walked away saying that I know this is gonna be a challenge, but I'm up for it. So since that time, with that awareness, that has helped me to recognize when people see me and, and you know, are not used to seeing me. So when, if I'm planning an event at an upscale private country club in the middle of Michigan, and that is where my client wants to go and so forth. And a staff member there is not used to seeing people like me. Sometimes it's a good thing and they're intrigued. Other times they're put off by it, but I can't let that determine how I deliver a first class event for my client how um, my constituents, the participants in the golf event experience that, play, that place. So I recognize it, I, uh, I prepare for it, and I deal with it when, it when it comes up. But many times I think it's an asset for me because I'm able to see things in a different perspective and use a different angle to approach things. I like that. Control what you can, right? I think that's yes. you know just an age-old uh, you know gem that we can live by, and then also appreciating that uh, being unique or or being in a situation where we have this different perspective or we're being viewed differently could potentially even be advantageous for us. So spinning the narrative completely in a one eighty uh, is that's that's pretty cool. I, uh, I I I love to hear that. Have you had to have any of these conversations with your children? Are these things that they have been um, communicated about or anything with regards to sports, school, growing up in a situation where, um, you know, we, we're in a really, really good place societally compared to maybe where we were 30, 40 years ago, but we are still dealing with certain challenging narratives I think especially with regards to uh, young black males. So do you have any thoughts on that or things that you've done differently with that in consideration? Right. So that's an interesting uh, question because I've tried to raise my boys in Howard County, Maryland, which you know is a pretty diverse uh, environment. I mean, the, the population of every ethnic group is higher, you know, if you will, than, than what you would expect. So with that comes a certain feeling of, you know, acceptance and, hey, mom, we're all the same. And, you know, why, do, why are you thinking like that? Because they've been raised in this, 
uh, it's almost homogeneous, you know, this environment here. But that being said, I do spend time building awareness in that. And there are many situations that happen in the news that I point out to you that every place is not like Howard County. And you need to be aware when you are in North Carolina or you are in Texas or some other place that isn't like uh, Howard County, that these things happen. And you need to prepare yourself. And, you know, every African-American mom, you know, teenage boys who drive and that sort of thing have prepared them about how to interact if they get pulled over by, uh, you know, policemen for whatever reason. And we, you know, tell kids, we want you to come home. We don't care about the ticket. We don't care about whatever. We want you to come home. And regardless if you're wrong or right, these are the things that you need to do. So from that perspective, I, I make them aware, I provide input, but I feel like sometimes they live in a different world and quite honestly, a better world, if you will, if they are not experiencing these, uh, you know, some things that, that would be unfavorable. Yeah, and I think for us, I mean, being in the DMV is unique in itself. You mentioned just the diversity that we have, whether it's Howard County, Montgomery County, PG County, some of the places directly outside of the city, being able to put us in a situation where maybe we're not having to deal with things like we're dealing with today, like down in Georgia, where there is kind of a controversial situation going on right now. But by all signs, you know, are pointing to your sons being a very, very good byproduct of both yourself and your husband. What are some things that you think have allowed you and your husband to raise two young boys and young men, actually, I should say now, as one enters senior year of high school and the other enters junior year of college, but they are successful student athletes. I know that's not always very, very easy uh, to do it, not just once, but twice. What are some things that have made your parenting style uh, with your husband unique? Well, I think um, when my kids were probably six and three, I think somewhere around there, there was a Saturday afternoon when having two boys in the house at that age was just crazy. I think I decided that I need to find activities for these <laughs> kids. I can't spend another Saturday in this house with this chaos. And that being said, we put them in sports early on. Um, and whether it was soccer or flag football or what have you, I felt like they needed to get out of the house and do something. And the kids sort of took to it. They enjoyed it. Now, you know, what was me? I never exposed them to music and that sort of thing. But that being said, we are a sports house. And I think both my husband and I instilled in them, one, you need to be able to take instruction. Two, you need to practice. And three, you need to play. And I think regardless of what sport, that holds true. One of the other things that we tried to do was put them in individual sports and team sports. And, you know, you should always have something that you do by yourself and you should always have something that you do in a team environment. For Elijah, that was golf, basketball, and football, golf being the individual sport. For Aaron, it was track and football. While there were team or relay events, he also did a number of individual events. So I think exposing your kids to a variety of different sports is helpful for them. And the, the sports will choose them. They will decide what they like and what they're good at and go from there. You say instruction, practice, and play. And I think we will agree that practice and play is something that is very easily accepted by a lot of parents and a lot of young people. But I think the thing that instruction makes me think about is coachability. And I think that this is something that can plague young people and business owners. What do you think it is about the mindset of people and potentially even parents who do not allow the concept of coachability and instruction to be readily accepted? 
Right. I mean, you have to learn. You know, I don't care where you are. You have to learn. And there are some of us who learn better by doing it on their own. There are some of us who learn better by having someone teach you. And in order for someone to teach you, you have to have an open mind. You have to be willing to listen. You have to be willing to take that instruction and, and, and try, try it out and see. I think coachability is huge. I think that makes the difference between a successful athlete, athlete or not. I think it makes the difference between a successful business person or not. I just think coachability is a facet of life that we can't get around and it only enhances you. I think you need to be able to understand as you get older that there, not all coaching is good coaching, if you will, and be able to discern the two, but you at least at a bare minimum need to be coachable to enhance your individual performance. And then when you take coachable, I mean, you take somebody who's willing to grow. You've been somebody who's made it a choice to grow over the years, both personally and professionally, your company continues to grow. What is next when it comes to your growth? What are some things that you're focusing on individually and potentially for Acuity? Sure. Individually, I am just trying new things. One, um, I've been introduced to Peloton, if you will. I would never want to stay in the house and ride a bike that goes nowhere, right? I'm an outdoors type of person, but I am all about my fitness and uh, trying new things to help me become more fit. So I've done CrossFit in the past. Right now it's Peloton and a little strength training in the house. So personally, I am all into my health and my, my wellness. I'm vegan now. You probably did, did not know that. You know, I'm all about health and wellness. For my business, I am looking to turn my services into products. Um, there are many people who have product businesses, and I think some of the most successful ones turn their products into services and have both. I am looking at more of turning my services into products, particularly in the event management space. Now, when you are talking about things like nutrition, you're talking about taking care of yourself first, right? Taking care of yourself so that you can be at your best as a mom, a wife, and a business owner. Have there been any particular times in which managing those different roles were particularly challenging for you? Absolutely. Particularly when my kids were younger and I heard this term called work-life balance, which I came to find out was sort of impossible to, to really have it balanced. And I learned that at times, some things will be a higher priority than others. So there were times when my kids were young and you're getting them the day, daycare and uh, school and sports and, and you don't have time to work out if you will. But there are other times, okay, they're all in school all day long and they're in aftercare or whatever. I can walk the track or run the track while they are working out. So um, there has always been this struggle around how do you balance things. And for some of the moms out there, I just want to tell you, it does get better, you know, over time. And you have to choose, you have to make sacrifices. Some I'm an early morning person, so getting up early does not bother me. But there were times where the only time to get in a workout or to have some quiet time to read is at 4.30 in the morning. And you trade that off. Do I do that or do I sleep an extra hour or two? For me, me being at my best is important. I would get up earlier and make that choice. I appreciate that insight, and I think um, a lot of the people out there, actually one of our most popular episodes was somebody who talked a little bit about some of the struggles of juggling all that as well. So um, I do appreciate that. With that being said, we're also going to be wrapping up today. Where can people learn about you and about Acuity and what's next for you in Acuity? 
Sure, they can always follow me on LinkedIn at Jandy Smith Turner or for Acuity, uh, www.acuityevents.net or www.acuitysports.com. So the acuityevents.net is more of the event management, the acuitysports.com is more of the golf event planning as well. Perfect, Jenny. Thanks for your time today. All right, thank you so much. Thank you for listening to the High Performers Podcast. We want to encourage you to join the conversation, access the show notes, and catch our latest episodes on the website. Please head to highperformerspodcast.com. And if you enjoyed the podcast, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give us a review on Apple Podcast. Until next time, thanks again for listening.